my name is Ken Bland with the American Wood Council. Uh, let me introduce uh, Mark Johnson's with Southwest Research Institute. Uh, Mark has a PhD from Ghent University in Belgium. He's been with Southwest uh, for a number of years and previously held the position of uh, the director of the fire technology department. He's now leads the the project team uh, that's assisting the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission on fire-based uh, design. So Mark's uh, interests over the years have focused on oxygen uh, consumption calorimetry, computer fire modeling, and the fire performance of wood products. We're uh, extremely uh, pleased that Mark was uh, willing to help us with these uh, demonstration tests and uh, at this point Mark uh, I think we'll turn it over to you and thank you all right thank you uh, so over the next uh, half hour or so I will try to give you a uh, quick overview of uh, the tests that we performed earlier this month and we uh, performed two tests in a furnished living room. Uh, the first test was uh, performed on uh, the 3rd of September. And uh, in that test, we used uh, a compartment that was constructed with uh, cross-laminated timber walls, uh, CLT walls, and uh, a nail laminated timber ceiling, or NLT ceiling. And then more recently, a few days ago, we had a second test uh, which was uh, nearly identical to the first test, but we used the CLT ceiling instead of the NLT ceiling. Uh, in both uh, tests, uh, the walls and the ceiling were protected with two layers of 5-8 Stipex gypsum board, and, uh, and that is what is in the, um, the uh, code change proposal. Um, the instrumentation that we used uh, we measured the heat release rate of the, the fire, and then we had thermocouples to measure temperatures inside the, the wall and the ceiling uh, between the layers of gypsum board and also between the gypsum board and, uh, and the wood, and measured incident heat fluxes and gas temperatures. This is just a, a, a brief overview to kind of give you a, a, an overall idea of what, uh, what we did. So, uh, first a few words about cross-laminated timber. It's a relatively, uh, relatively new engineer wood product, I would, I would say. Um, the cross-laminated timber that we used in the tests was provided by uh, Structural M in British Columbia. And it uh, consists of five layers of uh, spruce pine for lumber. Uh, the lumber is stacked at right angles and then it's glued together into a massive panel that uh, is approximately seven inches in thickness. So on, in, in the photograph, you can see that the, uh, the planks go in, in one direction, in one layer, and then in the next layer, uh, they're perpendicular, they go in the other direction, and then in the next layer, again, in, uh, in this direction, and so on. Uh, the, the the panels were provided, or the walls of the of the structure uh, were provided in in single panels. So each wall, the back wall, the front wall, and the side walls, that was uh, one panel each. And those panels were then connected together with uh, uh, screws that were about 12 inches long. And you can see here how uh, these uh, panels were were connected. Uh, and then this is the end result, uh, the uh, CLT wall assembly. Uh, this is uh, for the first test. Uh, for the second test, it's, uh, it was uh, pretty much identical. It was a little narrower and longer uh, because of the way uh, how we put the panels together. Uh, but that really did not affect uh, the results. Uh, you can see the dimensions here. Uh, these are uh, interior dimensions after the uh, gypsum board uh, was uh, installed. Uh, so about 14, 13 and a half feet uh, in length and close to 12 feet in width and 8 feet high. 
and then there was an open door in the front wall, a little over six feet wide and approximately seven feet uh, high. So in the first test we used a nail laminated timber ceiling and uh, we used a 14 foot long 2 by 6 southern pine floor joists that were nailed together. Um, and you can see the nail schedule that we that we used here on this slide. Uh, this was uh, provided by AWC. And on the next slide, uh, you'll see uh, the construction of the the NLT in in progress. So we just built this up until we covered uh, the entire room. And that took quite uh, quite some time to do that, but the net result was a, a solid panel, basically that was uh, about five and a half inches thick. In the second test, we used the CLT ceiling, and the ceiling came in two in in two panels, two halves. Uh, so you can see the first half that is being installed here on in this slide. And then the, the two uh, halves after they're put together, there is a spline at the top that you can uh, that you can see here, right here. Um, the seating was uh, fastened to the the walls uh, using uh, long screws, slightly different screws. Uh, we did not use any glue. We did not really glue the two halves of the ceiling together, or there was no glue between the ceiling and the uh, and the uh, uh, the wall panels. Once the ceiling uh, was uh, put on, we uh, covered the ceiling with uh, plywood, 19 30 seconds plywood, and then. Uh, placed the, the structural load. It was a distributed load consisting of concrete blocks that kind of resulted in a, in a load of approximately 40 pounds per square foot. Then the gypsum, the, there were two layers of gypsum that were put on the ceiling and on the walls and uh, they were placed uh, so that the joints were staggered and you can see this uh, in, in progress right now, the, the second seating layer being put on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had thermocouples to measure the temperature, uh, the temperature between the base layer of the gypsum and the wood, and then also between the two layers of gypsum and you can see on this slide the locations. We had uh, two sets of thermocouples on one side wall. You can see this here. We have a, a thermocouple here. It's two, about two feet. It's about one third down the compartment and about two feet from the floor and then four feet from the floor and six feet from the floor. Uh, so we had a thermocouple in these locations both uh, between the base layer of the gypsum and uh, the the wood, the wood wall, the CLT wall, and then between the two layers of gypsum boards. And then the same thing, um, we had another set here, about two-thirds down the compartment, and we had another set along the center line of the back wall, and then we also had two uh, sets of thermocouples uh, in the ceiling. Uh, this is the, a plan view of the other thermocouples that we that we had. Um, it's maybe a little difficult to see, but then in the pictures that I'll be showing, it might be uh, a little clearer. I'll try to point out where these thermocouples are. Uh, but we had a a thermocouple tree, this is the, the door location, there was a thermocouple tree to measure the temperature profile, the vertical temperature profile in the door. And then there was another one uh, 
again, about one third down the length of the compartment, and then a third thermocouple three that was about two thirds down. Uh, we had five thermocouples to measure uh, what I will refer to as the hot gas layer temperature. Uh, they are number 47, 48, 49, 50, and 51. Uh, those thermocouples were approximately four inches below the ceiling. And then we also had uh, plate thermometers. Uh, there was one located here, then one uh, six feet from the floor, the side wall. This, this one is below the ceiling. And then number 53 was uh, um, at the back wall. Uh, they were about four inches away from, from the wall or from the ceiling. So these plate thermometers are devices that are used in the uh, ISO fire resistance test standard. Uh, they can also be used to measure uh, heat fluxes. So that's the primary reason why, uh, why we use them, uh, so that we would have some indication of the, uh, the heat flux uh, at, uh, at those locations where we had uh, thermocouples inside the, the walls and in the ceiling. All right, I'll show you a few pictures of uh, the, the living room that we put together. Uh, we had um, a, a fire load that consisted of uh, a sofa, uh, two chairs. Uh, there was a, a heavy piece of our, uh, furniture in the back here, an armoire. Um, and then there was a bookcase on the other side, a coffee table and an end table. And you can you can also see here the the, the thermocouple trees, the one that uh, is one third down, the one at the door that is shown here, and the one in the back that's shown there. And this black square here is one of the plate thermometers. So moving around, you can see the there's a bookcase in the back, a TV, um, tube TV. Don't see those very often anymore, but. Uh, they uh, add more to the fire load than uh, uh, the flat screen TVs that are being used these days. So that's why we used one of those. Uh, this is sitting on a TV cabinet. And then we had another bookcase close to the, uh, the ventilation opening. Uh, this was a very heavy bookcase. Uh, the one in the back that you see there was uh, a little lighter. Uh, and uh, that will have some implications uh, as you will see as we go through the test uh, <clears throat> there was uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, wood that that was basically that continued to burn in this corner here because of this heavy bookcase and maybe because of the books too a little bit I don't know all right so how did we select this uh, this fire load um, the idea was to have a fire load that would be somewhere between the 50th, the 50th and the 95th percentile of uh, some surveys that have been conducted in Canada about 10 years ago or so by NRC Canada. And you can see here what the results are of this survey. Um, so they surveyed, uh, I don't know how many exactly, uh, how many living rooms they surveyed, but they measured uh, the fire load for these, uh, basically created the catalog of the, uh, the contents of each living room that they surveyed, and then they estimated what the fire load was that corresponds to that. And the distribution uh, that they obtained is, is shown here on this slide. So uh, in the first test, uh, as you can see, we were kind of high on, at the high end. Uh, about at, uh, at the 90th percentile. And then in the second test, uh, uh, we were a little higher, closer to the 95th percentile. But the fire load was definitely toward the high end of uh, uh, what was obtained in the Canadian surveys. And you can also see when you look at the contents of the living room, uh, it, was, uh, it was quite packed in there. So one probably would not put that much furniture in uh, in a room of that size. All 
All right. So let's uh, take a look at uh, at the test. Uh, in both tests, we used a, a standard ignition source. We used a, a source ignition source number two from a British standard 5852. Uh, British standard 5852 is a standard to uh, evaluate the flammability of upholstered furniture. Uh, so source number two is one of the smaller ignition sources. It's a small uh, a small flame that is applied for 40 seconds. So we applied this to uh, the uh, uh, one of the cushions of the sofa, and uh, we did the same thing in both uh, in both tests. Um, I'll show you the the heat release rate curve that we measured for the first test uh, because there will be a video in a few minutes and it will perhaps give you a better idea uh, of why uh, I'm showing I'm picking out the first eight minutes of uh, of the test to to show you how the fire uh, developed. Uh, as you can see here, we uh, we quickly reached a peak heat release rate once the the sofa started to. Uh, fire started to spread over the sofa. Uh, we had a flashover in about four minutes approximately and reached a peak heat release rate of about 5,500 kilowatts. And uh, what that means, uh, I'll show you another slide that uh, shows you a few objects that, um, that are burning and you can get a better feel for what the five uh, 5,500 kilowatt fire, how big that, that is. That, that is really a big fire. And it, it lasted approximately for maybe, uh, you know, about 10 minutes or so, and then, uh, then we were on the decay, burnt up most of the contents of the, of the compartment. So this is the slide that I was uh, talking about to give you a better feel for the heat release rate. On the left-hand side, you can see a very small fire, and the heat release rate of that fire is of the order of uh, 30 watts. Uh, so the power that is uh, dissipated in this uh, in this fire is comparable to that of a small light bulb. And then on the right-hand side, we burned um, a box of potato chips that are very flammable, and primarily because of the fat content. But um, this fire is actually a 300-kilowatt um, fire, so 300,000 watts. Uh, so this is 10 times, 10,000 times as much as the, the fire on the left-hand side. So as you have seen on the previous slide, in our tests we obtained a, a peak heat release rate of uh, close to six uh, megawatts. Uh, so that would be that would be the equivalent of uh, twenty of these uh, uh, twenty of these potato chips boxes that would be burning simultaneously at their peak heat release rate. Okay, so I have a video. The video is accelerated by a factor of eight. So you will see the first eight minutes, and it's condensed to one minute. And then, uh, then we'll skip and move directly to minute 28. And there's two more minutes that are condensed to, uh, you know, a few seconds. Uh, to, because from that point on, there's really not much happening anymore. So let's see if this works. So the ignition source is applied. 40 seconds later. So the sofa by itself was sufficient to create a flashover, and then as soon as you have a flashover, everything else starts participating, and you you get a pretty pretty significant fire. 
we also had a lot of smoke production and at some point we could not really keep up with uh, what was being generated so the whole the whole space for those there's a few, I noticed there are a few people that were actually there uh, to witness the test we had a, a smoke filled lab for about 10 15 minutes or so so this is uh, about half an hour into the test and what you can see here is that we had this armoire here in the in the back so that was a heavy piece of furniture a lot of wood and then we have a, a bookcase in in one corner here and then another bookcase in the front corner these were the the three piles uh, that, that kept on burning for quite some time and uh, and you you will see what the implications are or what uh, what the effect is of that So this is two hours from ignition. Uh, we terminated the test at uh, at three hours. Uh, you can see that uh, the ceiling is in uh, reasonable shape, except that we have some pieces of gypsum board that fell off, uh, and the fire was definitely the most intense, or the the impact of the fire was definitely the most intense here. Uh, but the base layer was still intact. And as I mentioned, we have these two piles of wood in the back here that are that continue to burn for quite some time. So that's also two hours, but this is the what is left of the bookcase, the heavy bookcase that we had uh, close to the the doorway. And then this is at the end of the test. We terminated the test at three hours, so 180 minutes. Uh, everything is pretty much uh, consumed. All right, let's look at some some temperatures. And I have uh, I'm, I'm I'm just showing the first 30 minutes because after that there's really not much uh, happening, and the temperatures are on the decay. Uh, but during the first uh, 30 minutes, you can you can see compared to a, to a standard uh, ASTM E119 curve, uh, this fire is quite a, a bit more severe. Uh, and uh, even after uh, I think uh, four hours or so, the ASTM E119 curve would not get to this type of this this high temperature. So we had peak temperatures of the order of. Uh, 1200 degrees C or about 2200 degrees F and these are the five thermocouples that are uh, located four inches below uh, below the ceiling in the center and in the four quadrants of the of the compartment so I as I mentioned I refer to these as the hot gas layer temperatures So the the impact of the fire was the most intense uh, at the ceiling. So what you see here are the temperatures that we measured. Uh, the the top curves are the temperatures in between the two layers of uh, of gypsum board. And uh, as you can see, it did not exceed 250 degrees C. And then at that point, the fire burnt out, and the temperature started to uh, to decrease. So about 500 degrees F. And then between the gypsum board and the nail laminated timber ceiling, uh, the temperatures were of the order of uh, uh, or about 95 degrees. Uh, C or around 200 F, uh, so that's the temperature at which the gypsum board essentially uh, loses moisture, and it will stay at that temperature for quite some time. Uh, so we never got to a point where uh, where this exceeded uh, the 95 degrees. So after the test, you can see what's uh, what's left. In the meantime, we lost a little more gypsum board off the ceiling. Um, and obviously, the temperature between the gypsum board and the ceiling might have been somewhat higher in this area, where uh, a piece of the gypsum of the 
the face layer fell off during the test, uh, but uh, you know you will see on the next uh, few slides that uh, the room was pretty much intact, or the ceiling was pretty much intact. So this is it. You look at the ceiling, NLT ceiling. There's really no no charring anywhere. Uh, but we did have some charring on the on the walls uh, in this location here, where the armoire was, and and then in this location where uh, one of the bookcases was located, and then in front where the heaviest bookcase was, there we had uh, the maximum damage, um, but the char depth uh, did not exceed a quarter of an inch here. So let's move on to the second test. The second test was very similar to the first test in terms of fire growth. The heat release rate was apparently a little lower, um, reached approximately five, five megawatts. It lasted a little bit longer. And uh, this test was terminated after two hours and 15 minutes. And I'll just show you a few pictures of the fire growth. Uh, so this is one minute from ignition. You can see that uh, this is pretty benign. You would be you would easily put this out if you if you wanted to, but uh, you know three minutes later you're like this. So you don't really have a lot of time to escape from these types of fires. Um, I should say that uh, we we looked at the foam, the uh, uh, polyurethane foam in in the furniture and uh, we, we basically put uh, polyurethane foam in there that was not treated with fire retardants and that had a relatively high density um, and that may not be exactly what you would have in your home but uh, it's sort of at the high end I suppose. And then at eight minutes uh, we have uh, as you can see, we're starting to build up uh, smoke in, in the lab, and that kind of lasted for another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we had the same thing as in the first test, where uh, our bookcase, our heavy bookcase, close to the, the doorway was, uh, was burning for, for a long time. And then we... Uh, I have another picture here when we terminated the test. Uh, so again, we have a bookcase in the back that's still burning, a little bit of the, the TV stand here, and then there's another bookcase uh, behind the wall here in the back, uh, another, an armoire uh, or what's left of it. So that also kept burning for quite some time. So the temperatures here look very similar to the, the first test. Uh, again, we reached a peak temperature of about 1200 degrees C, 2200 F. And so the comparison with uh, ASTM E119 is, is very similar. Again, looking at the ceiling uh, temperatures, uh, we have uh, it's somewhat similar, although the temperature between the CL2, in this case, and the base layer of gypsum did not uh, increase very rapidly, not as, not as quickly as in the previous test. Uh, and also the, the peak temperature was, uh, was somewhat lower. In the previous test we reached 250, here it was probably around 230 degrees C or so. So this is what the, the room looks like after the second test was uh, terminated and we removed uh, the contents. Uh, again, we had a, a little bit of uh, gypsum board fall off the ceiling in the, in the same area as uh, the same area here as in the first test. And then when you remove all the gypsum board, you can see that uh, as in the first steps, we had some charting where 
there was a, a bookcase and things uh, continued to burn for for some time. Uh, although the chart depth was uh, was very minimal here, uh, less than in the first test. Um, th this is, uh, I think, it's the the last slide. The um, we did not have any penetrations in this test, uh, but we did have our uh, plate thermometers, as I, as I mentioned before, and uh, they were mounted on a, a pipe, a thermocouple that uh, in, the, in the plate thermometer goes through a, a pipe, a steel pipe, that uh, penetrated a wall. So you can see where that uh, was, uh, I think this is the back wall. Uh, you can see the amount of charring that took place where that pipe penetrates the, the wall. Uh, to conclude, I uh, so this is, concludes the presentation of the uh, the experiments that we conducted. But uh, uh, Kuma asked me to also show you a few slides of uh, uh, standard testing that was performed. Uh, there was an ASTM E119 test that was done on uh, the same type of CLT panel, five ply, approximately seven inches thick. Uh, in this case, it was protected with only one layer of Type-X uh, gypsum board on each side, and the uh, objective was to obtain a two-hour rating. And uh, it was very successful and resulted actually in uh, more than three hours. Uh, three hours until structural failure occurred and there was flaming on the uh, unexposed side. So, in this test report, is uh, you can see the the URL here. It's a it's available from this uh, this link. So, the same system with one layer of gypsum board uh, performs very well in an ASTM E119 test. Uh, what we tested in the room was a uh, um, a two or wood system that was protected with uh, two layers of uh, 5H step X gypsum board. And um, the demonstration test basically showed that uh, that uh, particular uh, setup uh, does very well when, even when you have a very challenging fire uh, that uh, exceeds by far the exposure conditions or the intensity of the exposure conditions. So I think that completes the presentation. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Hey, Mark, it's Ken. We're, we're waiting to see if folks have questions. Uh, question for you, though. Would you be able to predict when uh, sidewall sprinklers would have activated during that initial growth phase? Uh, I think we would be able to, um, probably from the temperature measurements that we, that we have, uh, we would be able to predict when, uh, when a sidewall sprinkler system would activate. The, the temperature in the upper layer was pretty uniform, and you can, do, you can sort of take the, the, lower, the lower limit uh, to be on the conservative side, and you should be able to predict that. Uh. Okay, and just be be interested in knowing. I would I would imagine it's going to be around a minute thirty or or somewhere in that time period. Are you able to see the question from John Sue? I don't see a question. John is asking, uh, what would be the expected effect of enclosing the room versus having the large opening uh, to vent the heat? Uh, that's a good, uh, a good question, and we actually discussed that a little bit uh, here. Uh, the, the, the opening was specified by EWC, so we, we don't really know exactly uh, you know, what would happen um, if you were to make a smaller opening. Uh, our guess is that initially uh, 
you know, you wouldn't see much difference in terms of fire growth, but at some point you might have some ventilation limit, and when that occurs, that will that will you know determine um, what effects that could have, and it could go basically go two ways. You know, obviously you're enclosing the uh, or restricting the airflow into the compartment, which would uh, lead you to believe that you would have perhaps higher temperatures in the compartment. But then, on the other hand, you might get into an, um, you know, an oxygen starvation situation, in particular for these large fires that we that we had, and then um, then it would not have any effect on the temperature. We uh, are. Uh, uh, right now we're working on uh, trying to model these tests with Fire Dynamics Simulator and one of the reasons why we're trying to do that is to see what, uh, you know, what effect that could have um, if, we, if we make changes like uh, you know, changing the openings. Great. Uh, another question, this one's from Steve. Uh, to Giovanni, he's asking, I think probably this is a, a, a question for me, he's asking about the thickness of the CLT, the 7-inch thickness, and uh, it is a, a standard thickness, and it's closest to what the, the code proposal requires in terms of exterior wall thickness uh, for the CLT. So um, really that was, that was all about all that went into uh, selecting the thickness of the CLT, and also, um, Mark, in your response to uh, to Jonathan on the the opening, I might just add that uh, we looked at the tests that were conducted by Underwriters Laboratory, and they ran a similar test, which is available on their website, where they looked at traditional furnace shings versus what they're referring to as the modern uh, furnishings. So we tried to um, imitate the room size, uh, the contents, and the opening that they used in their demonstration test. So that's, that's another factor in what drove us, drove us to uh, select that, that opening size. Steve also asks, uh, were there any tests conducted without any gypsum layers? If so, are those results available? We have not tested, uh, AWC has not tested uh, any CLT uh, that's uh, exposed. There has been some testing conducted uh, in Canada with exposed CLT, and they've actually looked at different configurations um, of exposed surfaces to try to understand uh, what's the impact if opposing walls are um, not protected, if a wall, uh, if adjacent walls are not protected. Uh, so they do have some preliminary research where they're looking at, at the impact of leaving one or two surfaces within the within the space uh, unprotected. We hope to get to that point, but initially we wanted to start with, uh, with this test to uh, model what uh, is required in G165. Uh, at what temperature would the adhesives used in CLT lose strength? The, yeah, the uh, the adhesives that are used have a have a heat resistance, heat resistant adhesives in accordance with the ASTM standards. There is a manufacturing standard PRG 320 that requires the use of heat uh, resistant adhesives, and they have uh, uh, performance. Uh, known performance up to the charring t temperature of the wood itself. So there are going to be no weaker uh, in structural performance uh, 
very, very close to the temperature where the wood is charring. Mark, you, you uh, um, mentioned the uh, ventilation fans were overcome by the the smoke. What was the exhaust rate of your ventilation system at, at that time? Um, I think it was around uh, 20,000 CFM. And um, it has gone down since we uh, we have a new pollution control system that uh, apparently seems to uh, create quite a bit of uh, pressure. Okay. Um, we will get or, or resistance, I guess. Great. So a lot of it generated generated a lot of smoke more than you had anticipated. Yes. Well, I can't say it's a complete surprise based on you know some preliminary testing we did on the polyurethane foam, but uh, yeah, it was a it was. A, we were a little surprised by the amount that was being generated. Yeah. And normally we would do this test in a in a different building, a larger building, but unfortunately there was another test series going on in that building, so that's why we had to do it in our in our smaller calorimetry building. Another question, Mark: the uh, the charring on the uh, wall surfaces once you uh, remove the gypsum wallboard. Do you feel if if the uh, head fire fire had been left to burn longer, the longer duration before it was extinguished, that that char would have been more significant? Well, in the in the in the first test, uh, there was really nothing that burned at the time that we terminated the test. So after three hours, everything was was uh, done. Um, in the second test, we monitored the temperatures. Uh, and uh, we basically waited until the temperatures between the gypsum board and uh, the the base layer and the and the wood started uh, dropping or you know were continuously uh, decreasing. So and the gas temperatures were also decreasing. So everything was basically going down and. Um, I don't think it would have uh, really, if we had let it go until you know the three hours that we had before in the first test, that uh, there would be there would have been a lot of additional charring. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, I think that that concludes the the questions. So again, Mark, I want to thank you for uh, for your effort in pulling this program together in short order, and I'd like to welcome anyone that will be at the ICC hearings to stop by the American Wood Council booth. We'll have a couple samples of the CLT that was uh, used in these tests available at the booth and we'll also be showing some of the video uh, that uh, that was shown on this uh, program. So I encourage you to stop by in Long Beach on Sunday and Monday and uh, talk to the AWC uh, staff that are uh, at the booth. So again, uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank everyone else for participating. All right. Well, thank you.